This integral represents a problem. Um, on the one hand, it, it's something that we need to be able to evaluate. Uh, I know the function we're integrating here probably looks kind of weird, but that's actually the formula for a bell curve, the one that's used in statistics to represent a normal distribution. Specifically, it's a standard normal distribution. So this integral equals the probability that a randomly selected item from a normally distributed distribution is between zero and one. And if you've taken a statistics class, uh, calculating these probabilities is, is something you do practically every day for the entire back half of the class. So this is something that we need to be able to answer. The problem is this particular function that we're integrating here does not have a closed form antiderivative. In other words, it, it doesn't have an antiderivative that's made up of the of the sum and product of of elementary functions like like sines and cosines and logarithms and that kind of thing. Um, and I, mind you, I, I'm not just saying that it hasn't been found; it's actually been proven. It does not exist. It's it's not out there. Okay, but we still need to answer this question because, like I said, it, it's a very common uh, statistics question. So. How can we do this? Well, first, you notice that this is uh, a definite integral. So the answer is going to be a number. And a as a practical matter, in practice, you quite often don't need the exact answer. You don't need something with a square root or a logarithm or, or something like that in it. A numerical approximation, as long as it has a certain level of accuracy, is just fine. So what we're going to talk about in this section is, is different methods for approximating the values of definite integrals like this one. Now you've already actually seen some of this in, in first semester calculus when we talked about Riemann integrals where we had our, had our function. Right, this is uh, f of x equals x squared that we're looking at here. Uh, we we had this function and we wanted to find the integral of the function from with zero to four in my example here. And, and what we did is we broke it up into rectangles and we found the area of those rectangles and we added them up and said, okay, there's an approximate value. Then if you take the limit of the number of rectangles as n goes to infinity, you get the integral and that's the exact value. Okay, so this, this is one approximation method uh, that you already know, right? That, that you've already seen. And it's... Um, Unfortunately, not a particularly good one. And you can kind of see why in this diagram here. What we want is the area of the green shaded section. But if you add up these rectangles, you're also going to get this area up here and up here. So you're, you're going to be overestimating it. It, it looks like uh, quite a bit. And if you tried, I, I did this with the right hand endpoints of the intervals. If you try doing it with the, the left-hand endpoints, then you're going to get rectangles like this and this one. And you can see with this method, you're, you're going to be underestimating the area because you're leaving out these sections here. So these, these methods, this Riemann integral method works. It will give us answers, but... We have to have an awful lot of rectangles, an awful lot of subdivisions of that interval from zero to four before we start getting decent results. In fact, I'm sure you, hopefully you remember uh, how to calculate using these areas, but just in case, um, I, I went ahead and did these for us. Um, the uh, left-hand Riemann integral, that's the one where you, that I just drew in using the left-hand endpoints, that gives you an area of 14. If you add up those four rectangles, the right-hand one gives us an area of 29, so that that one is greater, which is what we expected we saw was overestimating. Uh, and of course, now you, you know how to do this. I mean, I, I'm using an example where we can calculate the exact answer, right? Because one, one thing we're going to want to do, and we'll do this in the very last lecture, uh, is talk about what, what's the error here? How, how much error can we expect? And we can kind of use that to, to pick out uh, which method is going to be best in a given circumstance. So the exact area here is 64 thirds, which is 21.33, which is 
repeating. So yeah, you can see neither of these is really giving us a very good result for just these uh, for just um, four intervals. So how can we do better? All right. Well, one, one approach that this is going to be our topic in this is what's called the midpoint rule or the midpoint method. With this one, instead of taking the endpoints of the intervals, they've got the same four intervals here. Instead of taking their endpoints, we take their midpoints and use those midpoints as the heights of our rectangles. And hopefully you, you can see just intuitively we're, we're getting a better result here. If you look at the right-hand rectangle, on the one hand, we're underestimating, excuse me, we're overestimating because we're including this section here when we shouldn't. But we're also overestimating because we're including this part here that we shouldn't. And if if you can, again, just kind of visually justifying what we're doing, those sections look to have very similar areas. So we are our hope is that they're going to kind of cancel each other out, right? Any any overage is going to be canceled out by an underage. It's not going to be exact, right? The areas of those two, two sections aren't perfectly the same, uh, but they're going to be close. And our hope is that. Uh, that's going to improve our results. So, um, what what I've done here, uh, this is the big formal definition. And all the, all this is saying is, is we're going to do the Riemann method, but we're going to use bit points instead of endpoints. But uh, I, I do think it's important that, especially as you're getting further into your your math education, you need to be able to parse out these things, right? So let, let's see if we can't read through this and see what it's saying. First, we're starting off with a function f, and the function has to be integrable on, on this interval. If it's not integrable, then there's no point in our talking about the integral. We might as well move on to something else, right? So we're, we're going to assume that we have a function and that it's integrable on the interval that we care about. And what the midpoint rule says is the area is, a, now you notice it's not equal, it's approximately equal to the function values at the midpoints times delta x. Right, the delta x's, those are the, the width of our rectangles. The function values at m1, m2, so on, those are the midpoints. Those are the heights. Right, and, and I've written that again over here, right, using the sigma notation. And you notice how, how I've expressed the midpoints, right? The coordinates of the midpoint are the halfway point between the endpoints, and that, that's what we've got here. xk minus 1 and xk, those are consecutive endpoints of an interval. Uh, and we're, we're averaging them, finding the function values. And down here, I just explain all, what all of these little terms mean. Delta x is b minus a divided by n, uh, x sub 0. We're going to start at a, x, x sub k is k plus delta x or is a plus k times delta x and i'm i talked about m sub k's over and over again up there uh, in this middle part so i've defined what they are right they're just the midpoints of their respective intervals okay a lot of fancy language going on in there let's look at an example here uh, and, and see how we can actually use this all right and i'm, I'm still referring back to y equals x squared Right, that's the diagram I had back on the first screen. So what we've done is we've divided uh, the interval into four sections, just like I did before, just like I did on, on the second diagram. So what, what are we going to do here? Well, I need to know the coordinates of the midpoints, and I need to know the function values at those midpoints. All right, so what are the midpoints? Well, remember... So let, let me add in another section over here. But let me actually put the interval over here. So our first interval is from 0 to 1, and the midpoint of that interval is at 0.5. The second interval is from 1 to 2. Its midpoint is at 1.5. We've got two more. 2 comma 3 will be at 2.5, and 3 comma 4 will be at 3.5. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate f of the midpoint, which is 0 0.5 squared. That's one half, right? One, one half squared is one fourth. So that's 0 0.25. Uh, 
then we're, we're going to do the others. I didn't work out each individual one of these. I just have the final answer here, but I'll write these all out. You're going to add up all of these values. Multiply that sum by delta x. What, what was delta x here? Delta x, remember, is b minus a over n. For our example, that's 4 minus 0 over 4. So you see, delta x is just 1. So actually, you're really just going to be adding up all those function values. And if you do that, right, the result that, that you get from the midpoint method, midpoint, is 21. Right? You, you remember what, what we had before. The left-hand value was 14. The whoop, not e. The right hand value was 29, and the exact value was 64 thirds. It was 21.333. So we we really did the same number of calculations, right? Same number of intervals. Uh, and with this midpoint method, we ended up getting a significantly better result. Right, that that's actually really close to the to the exact value um, for really re a relatively small number of calculations. So I I described it as being relatively close. Right, we we would like to be more precise about that. Uh, and in the last lecture in this series, uh, we are going to talk some uh, about it, uh, putting bounds on these errors. Exactly, what's the maximum amount of error? that we could expect. Um, but we're going to save that till the end. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about another method. It's called the trapezoid rule. Right? It's another approximation technique. And we've got one more to go after that. It's called Simpson's, uh, Simpson's method. Then I'm going to save talking about those errors until the very last lecture, and we'll talk about them all at once.